Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and isn't it a beautiful day in God's creation? This is His day. Welcome to your Father's house. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, our Creator, we notice more on a day like today, don't we? Your hand, your marvelous handiwork in your creation. We thank you, God, for the beauty of this snowfall. We pray that you would help us to spend some time outside today, not just to get into our garage, let down the garage door, go inside. Help us to spend some time appreciating and enjoying the wonder of your creation. We pray, God, that you would accept our praises, that you would change us because we've come to church, and that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're loved forever and ever in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please do me a favor and sign the little yellow attendance card. Uh, sign up for the Wednesday night meal. This week we're having uh, chicken parmesan with either red meat or white sauce, pasta, salad, dessert. Uh, sounds delicious. On Tuesday we're volunteering at Memphis Union Mission. That's at 445. And then the new couples Bible study uh, is at 630 here at the church over in the conference room. Look with me on the back of the bulletin. Uh, we have a total for our Christmas offering. It's usually an offering that we use to do some kind of capital project here at the church. Uh, we felt led this year to give the money toward tornado relief in Tennessee and Kentucky through Samaritan's Purse, and we raised $10,000. So thank you for your generosity with that. I'd like to remind you that you can give using the QR code. Uh, Jason can put that on the screen. Uh, particularly on a day like today when so many people are out, don't forget your offering and give today or throughout this week. It'll take you to the Easy Tide giving page on the website. All right, let's continue our worship. Please, so that we can praise the Lord through music.
is taken from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Let's continue singing Living Hope.
be seated. Our mission emphasis this morning is life choices. And if you brought in your bottles this morning, thank you so much. I know we have a lot of people out because of the weather, so we'll extend that deadline uh, for collecting the bottles that we've uh, been giving money, putting money in for life choices. Uh, we're going to show a video this morning. Hope it touches your heart as it has mine. Fifteen years old and pregnant. That is not an easy situation to be in. No one wants that for their daughter or for themselves. Yet that is where I was. Scared to death, confused and paralyzed by fear. It was the darkest time in my life. Looking back, the word darkness seems to be the best way to describe it. So many people around me were saying, if you don't have an abortion, it will ruin your life. People that I looked up to, even teachers and friends, were telling me that an abortion was the only option. But even at 15, I knew it wasn't right. At my lowest point, when I had no one else to turn to, I turned to God. And the next thing I knew, I was at Life Choices. The staff at Life Choices treated me so different from everybody else. They listened to me, they loved me, and when I said I wanted to have my baby, they fully supported me. I got to have an ultrasound and see her precious little heart beating. I took parenting classes and birthing classes and learned all that I could about becoming a good mom. I really don't know if I would have gotten out of the darkness without life choices. God used these special people in a big way in my life. Then my beautiful baby girl, Kaden, was born. I even went back to life choices after she was born and got a basket filled with great stuff. When they said I couldn't, I graduated high school and even graduated from college. Soon after that, I met the most incredible man and now we're married. We've created a loving home for Caden to grow up in. The word most often used to describe Caden is sunshine. She's a light in my life, of course, but she is a light and joy to so many people. Only God could have done it, bringing me out of the darkness and into the light. And now I've got this little bit of sunshine by my side. I know what Life Choices did for me and for Caden, and I am a huge advocate for them. I send people to them all the time. There's nowhere better for a young girl or a woman in an unplanned pregnancy to go. Nowhere else will provide all that Life Choices does with the education, support, love, and encouragement. We are so grateful. My name is Emily. And my name is Caden. And we choose and cherish life. Pray with me, please. Oh God, we thank you for Emily's story and Caden's story and 900 other children whose lives were saved last year because of life choices. Thank you, God, for using us in a small way to be a part of that very big, very important story. God, please forgive us if we have seen abortion as a political issue instead of an issue of life. Please forgive us if we've ever said something like, my body is mine, the decision is mine, in any instance. Please, God, help us to understand deeper and deeper that our lives are yours. And God, I pray for women who even now may be struggling with the idea of having an abortion. I pray for women within earshot of my voice online and perhaps even in the sanctuary who've had an abortion and ask you to comfort them as only you can. Make us to know that you're the God of second chances. And please continue to use the staff at Life Choices and those who volunteer to make a real difference for people today, tomorrow, throughout all this year. 
May we cherish life. May we cherish the promise of eternal life. Master, we pray for those who are sick, for those who are afraid. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray for first responders, doctors and nurses, firefighters, police officers, sheriff's deputies, so many on the front lines, the men and women who wear the uniform of our armed forces. We ask God you would take care of them and their families. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to know today through this service, whether we're here in person or listening online, help us to know that you're the God who loves us when we're unlovable. You're the God who goes with us in the good days, the bad days, and all those in-between days. May we know that your love is certain, and may we find our hearts warmed in response to your love. Please hear us now as we pray together the prayer taught to us by your Son, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's stand together and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. Well, good morning. Hey, did y'all remember that Cliff and Ruth have been on vacation? They went out of the country during the Christmas holidays, so I really don't know who's going to be on Faith Mountain. Levi, you come knocking. Let's see who's on Faith Mountain. Thank you, bud. Whoa! Happy New Year! Well, it's you, Cliff. Yep. Hey, so glad to see you made it back from your Christmas holiday. Yes, me too. Let's see, you and Ruth went to... S Sweden. Sweden, that's that, right. That's right. We have family there, so we decided to spend Christmas with them. Hey, did y'all have a good time? Oh, it was wonderful. It's always great being with family. And I tell you, Sweden is absolutely yeah, beautiful at Christmas. I bet. Yeah, the decorations, the lights, the cold. Why, everything is just magical. Whew, I bet it was, and, and what a better present could you give to your family than the gift of your time at Christmas? You're right. Like you always say, Pastor Tim, the best gift you can give someone else is the gift of T-I-M-E, time. That certainly is giving your best. Hey, and speaking of giving your best, I have something I'd like to show you about giving your best to God. Oh, boy, fun. Is this one of your fun demonstrations? Well, I hope it is, and you know, I have a friend that helps me with these, Cliff. Oh, really? I don't come up with this stuff on my own. Oh, okay. And I tell you what, I need two children to help me. How about you two sisters? Will that work? All right, you sit right there. Okay. And here, here's my illustration. It's really pretty simple, Cliff. Okay. Hey, do you like Smarties? Oh, I love Smarties. I bet you girls like Smarties. Well, all right, you get that one, and you get the, all the rest of them. You get the whole jar. And now that's my demonstration. Wait. Um, what? Pastor Tim, yeah, are you finished? I, I, I mean, is yeah. that your demonstration? I mean, the girls got smarties. What's the big deal? Well, um, it doesn't seem quite fair. Oh, oh no. Well, let's keep let's go on and pretend like you do. Okay. So, I mean, why wouldn't they be happy if she did like sweet things? Both sisters have smarties. I don't see the problem, Cliff. No. Oh. Well, this is true, Pastor Tim, but did you give your best? I mean, it doesn't seem quite fair that only one got one Smarty and the other got a whole jar of Smarties. Well, you're right, Cliff. You're right. I think you're beginning to figure it out. Uh, hey, it reminds me of a story in the Bible. Oh, really? Would you like to hear it? Well, yeah, if it helps explain why you divided the Smarties the way you did, then absolutely. All right, so here we go. D do you know the story in the Bible of Cain and Abel? Oh, why? Who could forget? Yeah. Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve. That's right. In the book of Genesis, right? That's right. They were brothers. Yep. Well, let me tell you the story of Cain and Abel. So Abel kept flocks. That means he had sheep. Okay. And his brother Cain was a farmer. He had crops. Well, one day they both brought offerings to God, and Cain just brought a few of his fruits and vegetables. You know, he didn't even bring the best stuff. No. Maybe like a moldy carrot yeah. and, and some uh, kind of rotten apples or something yeah. like that. I know, not very good. 
But his brother Abel brought the best that he could bring, the firstborn of his flock. Oh. Well, God liked Abel's offering, but Cain was really angry about it. In fact, because God didn't like his offering, Cain had an angry face. Can you make an angry face? Ooh, yeah, that's pretty angry. Yeah, okay, but why didn't God like Cain's offering? He brought fruits and vegetables, and after all, fruits and vegetables are good for you. Wasn't that good enough for God? That's a good question, Cliff. It wasn't that Cain only brought fruits and vegetables, but the key word is that he didn't bring his first. He didn't bring his best. Oh. Abel did bring his best. He brought a lamb that was healthy and whole. On the other hand, Cain only brought some fruits and vegetables. He didn't give God his best. Oh, I see it now. You showed us how we would feel if we were only given one Smarty instead of a whole jar of Smarties. That's it. Yep, and that's how God felt, right? That's right, Cliff. You got it. God wasn't happy because Cain hadn't given him his best. Yeah. But God was happy because Abel did give God his best. Okay, so one more question, Pastor Tim. Okay. What can we do now to give our best to God? Well, there's several things. One thing we can do is read the Bible. Yeah. Another is to pray, to talk to God. Oh, when we talk to God, it's prayer, right? That's right. That's yep. how we talk to Him. Yep. And God likes it when we spend time with Him in church, like we've done today. Yes. And like when we give our offerings, see how faith is holding the piggy bank? Yeah. So when we give our piggy bank offering and the adults put offerings in the plates. Okay. God likes it when we do it with a cheerful heart, when we want to support His church. I see. Well, so Pastor Tim, how are you going to divide the Smarties now? How will you give your best now? All right, here's what I'm going to do. First of all, Cliff, I know you like Smarties. How about that? All right, boy, you Thank took you. that quick. How about you, sweetheart? Okay, and y'all got yours. There you go. How about yours, baby? And yours? And here's one for you, darling. So see, how's that, Cliff? Everybody got smarties. That seems very fair. All Except right. for the one who doesn't like sweets. Yeah, but you know what? She's eating them. Oh, so well, I think she then, must okay. Like Maybe them she likes all. sour things. <laughs> too much sugar, baby. That's like okay. Yeah, gotcha. too much sugar is not good. Okay. All right. Are y'all ready to pray? Will you yeah. play with us? I will pray. All right, you put your hands together. We'll say, Father. Father. I love you. I love you. Help me to be more like Abel. Help me to be more like Abel. And give you my best. And give you my best. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Bye, Thank everybody. Happy New Year. Nice reading. Okay, put them in. Up. Oh. You might bite your fingers. Be careful. Let's continue our worship now through giving our tithes and our offerings.
us pray together. We praise you, Father, as do the angels and all those who've gone before us in faith. We praise you for who you are and for sending us your Son and for blessing us in this life and in the life to come in ways we can't even begin to count. Please accept what we've returned to you as a portion of our giving, a portion of all the gifts given to us. We pray, God, that we would do it cheerfully, that we would do it in gratitude, and that we would continue at the top of this hill to serve you and love you. In Christ's holy name, amen. And we'll join together in singing, Jesus Calls Us. Please be seated. Would you turn with me in your Bible or perhaps find it on your device? Look up at the screen to Leviticus 3.16. In this uh, sermon series for the year, we'll go through all the books in the Bible that have a chapter 3 and a verse 16, thinking about the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. So what's the context of this chapter? This is a chapter in which Moses is telling the people about the offerings that they need to make, the sacrifices that they make. And this particular offering is called the fellowship offering. It's an offering giving thanks to God for His blessing in their lives. Let's listen to this one verse. The priest shall burn on the altar the fellowship offering as food. An offering made by fire, a pleasing aroma, all the fat is the Lord's. We're going to flesh out what that means. Why is it that the fat portions are the Lord's? Our New Testament lesson is 2 Corinthians 9, beginning with the 6th verse and reading through the 11th, as Paul talks about giving God our best. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever shows generously will also reap generously. Every man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, He has scattered abroad His gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result 
in thanksgiving to God. This is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to us that we would not only understand it, but obey it. Let's bow our heads. Oh Lord, our God, we confess that we haven't always given you our best. Sometimes we haven't given you anything at all. And other times we've given you just kind of a stingy portion, what was left over. But then there were times when we did give you our best. We knew that it pleased you. We had a wonderful expression on our faces and a, a lift in our step. More and more, would you teach us how to do that all the time? In the name of Jesus, amen. When money is given in the church, it's collected in lots of different ways, isn't it? Right now, we're putting offering in the plates that you have at various points in the church. Some churches have boxes out in the lobby. In some churches, the gifts are put in a basket and they have a stick that they hold out through the pews. I remember years ago when I was in seminary in Atlanta, we had an assignment one semester. We were to go to all different kinds of churches. And so one Sunday, Renee and I, newly married, and some of my buddies from seminary, went to a large black Baptist church in Atlanta. It came time to give the offering, and everybody came down front. And they had people up there counting the offering as you gave. And it was put into big plates, and they were counting it. And you went back, and we sang a lot, and evidently we found out that we hadn't given enough. And so everybody was invited to come back down and give again. And they went off and counted, and we sang some more songs, and that was enough for that day. I'll never forget it. Back in the day, God's people didn't give him a portion of their money, but in a similar way, they gave him a portion of their crops and their livestock. The way that it worked is that you brought a portion of your crops, a portion of your livestock to the tabernacle, the place they worshipped when they were traveling through the wilderness, then later to the temple, and the priest got to eat some of that, and then the priest sold some of that for his own living and to take care of the upkeep of the temple. It's an interesting system. There were five types of sacrifices that they used in Old Testament times, five types of offerings that they gave. The first one was the burnt offering, and this was a bull, a ram, or a male bird, and it was given as an atonement for unintentional sin. And all of us are guilty of unintentional sins, things that we do simply because we're foolish, because we're human, we hurt somebody's feelings, we didn't mean to, things happen. Today, we're forgiven of those sins because Jesus forgives all of our sins when we trust him. Back in the day, the unintentional sins were taken care of with a burnt offering. The second offering was a grain offering. So this would be grain, flour, even baked bread. Uh, if you can imagine in your, in your mind's eye, can you smell fresh baked bread? Is there anything that smells better than that? We uh, didn't have donuts this morning. The donut shop was closed, so... Uh, Tina Donnan went over in the kitchen and she just started baking some uh, cinnamon bread just on her own, a coffee cake for all of us. You could smell it all through the church. Well, this kind of offering back in the day was given as an expression and gratitude for the goodness of God. We still need to give these kinds of offerings. God is so good to us, and part of the reason we give offerings every Sunday is to express our gratitude. The third offering was the sin offering. This was a female lamb, a female goat. For poorer people, it was a dove or a pigeon. And this was for forgiveness of their sins, the sins they committed intentionally. And it's still true today. Sometimes we set out to do something wrong. We've made up our mind we're going to do it. Come hell or high water, we're going to do the wrong thing. These sins today are forgiven by the blood of Jesus. When we trust Him, we're forgiven. The fourth kind of offering was the guilt offering. And this again was a ram or a lamb from your own flock or one that you bought. 
And it was atonement for sin requiring restitution. Sometimes when we sin, we need to make it up to people. And this was the sin covered in this offering. And then the last one is the one that we're talking about in Leviticus 3.16. It's the fellowship offering. This could have been any animal from a herd or a flock, and it was an act of thanksgiving, the kind of offerings we still give today in gratitude and thanksgiving for what God's done for us. Which takes us to Leviticus 3.16. The priest shall burn them, that is, the fellowship offerings on the altar, as food, an offering made by fire, a pleasing aroma, all the fat is the Lord's. Now, to have a good-smelling steak, you've got to have a little fat in it. Last night, our youngest son, Josh, grilled hamburgers for us and hot dogs and some Polish sausage. And man, the smell of that is so wonderful. It gets you ready for that meal. So when you listen to the Bible, also try to do a little smelling. Try to use all of your senses, not just your sight, not just your hearing, but the smell. So think about the smell of a steak that's grilling. There were some graphic explicit instructions given in Leviticus 9 about how they were to do this. First of all, the person who's bringing the offering is to lay his hand on the head of that animal and slaughter it at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Now imagine if we had to do that out in the lawn of the church before we came in here to worship. Imagine what that would be like. Some of you are pretty squeamish, and I think you'd have a hard time killing the animal before you sacrifice it. It reminds me of a story of one of the sweetest old ladies in my first church. Her name was Sarah Maiden. When she moved to that little town back in the 40s, she was a city girl. She'd never been to a little town. And she married and went to the grocery store one morning because she wanted to fix fried chicken for her husband. So when she called ahead and told him she wanted a chicken, she pulled up at the store, and on the back floorboard of her car, they put a chicken. Legs tied up, string wrapped around the beak. The thing was alive, and it freaked her out. And she called her husband, and she said, Bill Maiden, you better get home and kill this chicken if you want supper. It's so foreign to us, this idea of slaughtering something. We just go to the meat counter, don't we? Then the priest shall sprinkle the blood against the altar on all sides. Think about that. Sacrificing is a bloody thing. The blood was literally sprinkled all over the altar just as it symbolizes the sprinkling we have when we're baptized, the blood of Jesus coming down upon us. He's to bring a sacrifice made to the Lord by fire. All the fat that covers the inner parts or is connected to them. Which reminds me of that story that Cliff and I were talking about in the puppet show. It's about old Cain and Abel. Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil. He knew the offering given to God for a sacrifice should have been something better. But instead, he gave God the leftovers. Might have been an apple that was mealy. Might have been a head of lettuce that had gotten shriveled. But his brother knew better. And Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. Throughout the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, there's a thread that forgiveness of sins comes through the shedding of blood. In the Old Testament times, it was the shedding of blood of an innocent animal. In New Testament times and in our time. It's the shedding of the blood of our innocent Savior, Jesus. And y'all, it's really very simple. God's people were instructed to give Him their best, not their leftovers. Their best. And in the same way that we should not drop a five in the plate, as the old country song says, when we spend more, much more than that on other things, the ancient Jews did not give God moldy grain or an animal with defects. If we're dropping a five in the offering plate, you can't even eat lunch today for five dollars. We're not giving God our best if we do that. 
Which leads me to this collection that Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 9. And our Christmas offering is similar to that offering that Paul was collecting for the poor in Jerusalem. So this year, the elders, we decided we'd do something different. We usually have a Christmas offering for a capital project, something like the screens, uh, the projector, the new sign, something like that. But this year we were really struck by what had happened with those tornadoes right around Christmas. And so our offering went totally for them, Samaritan's Purse distributing it. We raised $10,000. That's a lot of money. And Paul reminded the Christians in Corinth that they had made pledges. Somebody might say, well, preacher, why do you have pledges at church? Why, Why should I promise to give a certain amount? Because it's biblical. Paul said, I thought it necessary to finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. He holds them to their promise. Let me ask you, have you made your pledge to the church? Obviously, some of you haven't because we haven't received all the pledge cards back. So if you haven't made your pledge yet, would you please do that? Bring it this next Sunday. Bring it Wednesday night. Put it in the mail. It's a way for you to know definitely, God, this is what I know I need to do, and I'm promising you that I'll do it. Paul says this, Remember, whoever sows sparingly, think about seed, will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So think about it like this. If you like turnip greens like I do, or radishes, or mustard greens, and you went out in your big garden and you just threw out a few seed, it takes a whole lot of turnip greens to make a mess. You're not going to get much. And the same thing is true in your spiritual life. If you just sow a little bit, if you're dropping a five in the plate, or God forbid you're not giving anything to the work of Christ, you're not going to get anything back. Or you're going to get very little. Each one of us, Paul says, should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now let me give you an analogy. All of us like to be on the winning team. And so generally, in the SEC, if you vote and cheer for Alabama, you're going to win. You're on the winning team. Until this year, and they didn't do it for once. It's about time, right, unless you're an Alabama fan. And you cheer for that team. You're so excited. Well, in a much bigger way, if you're on God's team, and you're cheering for God's team, and you're giving toward His work, there will be a smile on your face. You'll never have a losing day. Never. What I want you to take away from this sermon, first of all, just a general principle. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was prefigured in those Old Testament sacrifices, the lamb, the ram, the bull. And so those sacrifices are no longer necessary. The giving, the offering for sin, we no longer have to do. Jesus did that for us. However, the instructions for giving our offerings to the Lord have not changed when it comes to the fellowship offerings, to the thank offerings. We're to give God our best, not our leftovers. Give God your best. And in the same way the ancient fellowship offering was an act of thanksgiving and worship, so we sing the doxology after we give our tithes and offerings in worship today. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. God, you've given me, my family, my church so much. Please accept this portion I'm returning. Three principles for giving God our best. First of all, give regularly. If you put it off and say, I'll give next week, I'll give next month, you won't do it. It's human nature. So promise to give regularly, proportionally. The second one is to actually give proportionally. The scriptures say 10%, and if you're not giving 10%, I want you to at least get started. Give him 1%. If you make $100,000, just give him 1%. 
But next year, give him 2%. And the next year, maybe you can bump it up to 5 You will never find yourself hungry. You'll never find yourself wanting if you give generously to God. And the third principle for giving God your best is to give cheerfully. I like the quote I gave you at the beginning of the sermon. The everyday choices we make regarding money will influence the very course of eternity. People are coming to faith because of our giving. And that's why Paul can say, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Amen? Let's bow our heads. God, thank you for the principle given in the Bible, summed up in the words of Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And since all of us have received so very much, Help us to give generously that some other folks may know about your grace and come to love your church as we do. In Jesus' matchless name, amen. Take my life and let it be. Love
you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ. I sure would like to talk to you about that. If you'd like to become a part of this church family, I'd love to talk to you about that also. And we'll welcome you with open arms. May God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you and those you love, now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's amazing. That's amazing.